distinguished lecture. So um, this one is on labor market dynamics and the chair is Professor Ravi Srivastava from JNU. Uh, unfortunately, in this lot of four papers, two have dropped out at the last moment for various reasons. Antara Dhar for uh, health related uh, issues and Yasir Khan because the visa never came. I mean, that's one of our tragedies in this part of the world. So we are left with two papers. Uh, Professor Srivastava, it's up to you. <coughs> Thanks very much, and um, thank you for inviting me to the conference and to the session. This, as it turns out, this is more or less a continuation of the last session because we ended there with a paper on, also on. Uh, agricultural labor market dynamics and there was a lot of uh, other labor market issues which were also dealt with in the last sessions. So I'll, um, we have to make up for some lost time but we also I think need to end by around 5.30. Uh, so I'll, uh, what I think we should do is, this is uh, maybe 15 minutes each to the presenters. Uh, Okay, so 20 minutes, and then yes, we can, I mean, uh, the discussions may be 20 minutes, 20 minutes, but then you'll spill over an hour. Uh, <laughs> so, okay, so we'll begin with uh, mm, uh, Dr. Ganga Tilakratna, IPS, uh, Colombo, and uh, I think we should keep it 15 to 18 minutes. I'll warn you so that... Uh, <laughs> Good afternoon. Well, I hope all of you can see me, if not at least hear me. <laughs> um, so this is actually my uh, paper is on social protection and labor market outcomes in Sri Lanka and empirical analysis. This is based on a um, report, uh, uh, a draft paper that I uh, prepared for uh, International Labor Organization, New Delhi, and South Asia Research uh, Network on employment and social protection for inclusive growth. So I'm really grateful for, to ILO and SANET for their support. Um, uh, well, <coughs> giving you the outline of my uh, research. So first I'll talk about the background and motivation and then objectives, methodology. And then I'll briefly give, an, uh, give a brief overview of the Sri Lanka social protection system and the labor market situation. And then I will present the empirical um, uh, findings or the results of my uh, econometric analysis looking at the relationship between social protection and labor market outcomes, and then conclusions and policy implications. Uh, giving some background to the study, we all know that social protection has been increasingly looked, looked upon as an important tool for addressing poverty, vulnerability, inequality, and social exclusion. And evidence from number of studies have also shown that social protection has contributed to the achievement of MDGs in many countries, like in the case of Sri Lanka. And it has also been recognized as an important element uh, for the post-2015 development agenda. Uh, but there is no uh, agreed definition of uh, social protection at the moment, but we can broadly consider it as a set of programs and policies that enable vulnerable groups to prevent, reduce, and cope with risk. So a number of studies have, um, uh, from different countries have examined the relationship between social protection and labor market outcomes like labor force participation and employment status. So some studies have shown somewhat a negative effect of social protection uh, on labor market uh, outcomes, especially cash transfers and uh, pensions, while some others have found positive effect. There are some studies that have not shown any significant effect of social protection on labor market outcomes and a handful of studies have demonstrated somewhat a mixed uh, effects depending on the uh, age group and um, uh, or the gender category. But however, uh, uh, in the case of Sri Lanka, no empirical analysis to date has explored the relationship between social protection and labor market outcomes like labor force participation, despite Sri Lanka's long history of providing social protection to various vulnerable segments of the population as well as um, a large number of social protection programs in the country at the moment. 
So in this context, so uh, the objective of my study was to analyze the relationship between social protection and labor market outcomes in Sri Lanka. In particular, the study analyzes the effect of social protection on labor force participation and the effect of social protection on employment status, that is employment categories, like whether the individual is an employee uh, or employer or an account worker or unpaid family worker and so on and so forth. So the broad methodology of the study, uh, it uses an econometric analysis or regression analysis as well as a descriptive analysis. So the first part of the study where I uh, give an overview of the social protection system and the labor market uh, situation, I use a descriptive analysis based on various secondary data and the second part, the econometric uh, uh, second part looking at the effect of social protection on labor market outcomes, I use an econometric analysis based on the household income and expenditure survey 2009-10 of the Department of Census and Statistics. So let me first give an overview of the social protection system very briefly. Uh, currently, there are a large number of social protection programs uh, in Sri Lanka, so broadly we can categorize them into social insurance programs, social assistance programs, and labor market programs. So social insurance programs are largely employment related and um, it uh, mainly include the old age retirement benefit schemes. And the public servants pension scheme is currently the largest social insurance program which accounts for about 65% of the total social insurance expenditure. And then in addition to that, there are pension and insurance schemes for informal workers which are actually voluntary and contributory um, and uh, some social security programs for low income groups. So social assistance, which are largely cash and in-kind transfers, there are a number of programs uh, targeting uh, targeted towards um, um, different groups like low-income households, elderly, disabled, so on and so forth. But Samurti program, which is the largest, it's the largest uh, cash transfer program, and it is uh, uh, currently it covers around 30% uh, of the households, even though the poverty level is only 6.7% at present. Um, and then there are uh, livelihood and skills development programs, which we can uh, put under labor market programs. So in um, in the my econometric part of the analysis, actually the focus is going to be largely on the social insurance and social assistance due to uh, limited uh, uh, due to the data constraints. So just to give, uh, give you a brief overview of the labor market situation, so this provides a snapshot of the labor market situation in Sri Lanka. So as you can see, the unemployment rate has declined over the years and currently it's about 4%, but the female unemployment is uh, much higher than the male unemployment rate and the youth unemployment remains much higher and uh, despite the reduction in unemployment about 61 percent of the employed are still in the informal sector and adding to that we can see that the labor force participation also has remained more or less constant and the female labor force participation has continued to be very low around 30 percent actually it's one of the lowest in South Asia um, and it is um, less than half of the labor force participation among men. So let's look at the, uh, the, the results of the econometric part of the uh, analysis uh, where I, um, I looked at the relationship between social protection and labor market outcomes. So in order to uh, do that, I estimated two models. The first one is to look at the effect of labor force participation, uh, effect of social protection on labor force participation. So where, uh, for which I used a probit model where y is equal to 1 if the individual participates in the labor force and uh, y e is equal to 0 otherwise and x is a vector of individual and household level as well as I use some spatial uh, variables. And in the second model, I try to estimate the effect of social protection on, on employment status using a multinomial logit model. So here y is a multinomial variable uh, which takes uh, four different employment, category, uh, employment categories, private uh, employee, public employee, own account worker, and so on and so forth. Um, so basically I, I, I use different bases uh, first to uh, uh, find out um, uh, the, the, the results. Um, uh, so uh, as mentioned earlier, so I used the household income and expenditure uh, survey data which covered around 22,580 households and only the individuals age 15 and above were considered for the analysis. So the key variable of interest in this analysis was household social protection income. So where we actually, here what we consider was the monthly household social protection income as a percentage of monthly household expenditure, which we use as a proxy for household uh, income. So what we actually tried to find out was the importance of social protection to the household, not whether they actually 
receive social protection or not because the, the programs are actually very different from one to another. But one limitation is in this data set uh, uh, that we have only a limited number of social protection uh, variables, Samurdi, which is the largest social assistance program, pensions, the largest social insurance, and the disability benefit. So we use actually a number of control variables to control for various individual and household level uh, characteristics uh, like uh, age, level of education, marital status, and also uh, to control for spatial characteristics, we use sectoral and provincial dummies. So this is the result of uh, uh, the first model. So what we find here is um, that there is a negative association uh, between uh, the, the share of social protection income to the family and uh, uh, the labor force participation of the individual of the family. So, but you can see that the, the effect is actually negative, but it's, it's very small, it's marginal. Basically, an increase, a 1% increase in the share of social protection to the household would kind of lead to a re, uh, the, uh, reduce the probability of labor force participation by only 0.17 percentage points. So it's actually a very small negligible amount. And you can see the, uh, the same um, uh, relationship, uh, negative relationship for both uh, male and females, but again, it's uh, quite small. We also looked at uh, the effect of social protection on labor force participation for different age groups and gender. Basically for youth, which we define as 15 to 24, and then the prime age group, 25 to 59, and then for elders. So what we found here was um, that the, the, the relationship um, um, between social protection income and the labor force participation, there was actually a negative uh, association for both prime age categories and elders, but for youth of, uh, sorry, uh, prime age categories and and, and elders of both male and female, but for the youth category, we didn't find any significant relationship uh, between social protection and labor force participation. Uh, well, this is just to give a little bit, uh, um, a bit of um, an idea about the control variables. I didn't want to present uh, all the details about the control variables. I've given all these details in the paper. But basically, the science and significance of all the control variables were basically largely inconsistent with our prior expectation. Now, for example, we found that being a head of the household was associated with a positive effect on the probability of labor force participation while having a disability or being a disabled person was associated with a negative effect regardless of the gender or age category. And also um, in some cases, you know, male and female labor force participation were affected differently by some control variables as we ex expected. For example, having, a children, uh, uh, having children below age of six affected the probability of labor force participation among female while for, for men, it was not significant. And being married compared to being sig uh, single, it reduces the probability of labor force participation for females, but increases the probability of labor force participation for males. Uh, looking at the results of the, uh, the second model, basically what we try to look for is um, uh, the effect of social protection on lab employment status. The employ so we here actually what we found was when we use different base categories, um, for government, when we use the, the government employee as the base category, we didn't find any significant uh, results. So we actually found significant results when we use the unpaid family worker as the base category. So what we find here is um, uh, that compared to, uh, we, we find that positive effect for private employee and the own account worker when we use um, unpaid family worker as the base category. So what it uh, shows is that an increase in the share of household social protection uh, income increases the relative probability or the likelihood of an individual being an own account worker or a private sector employee compared to an unpaid family worker. But again, when we looked at the marginal effects, the marginal effects were very small, uh, in fact, negligible. So in conclusion, um, so the study, um, as I mentioned, it analyzed the relationship between social protection and labor market outcomes, in particular, the effect of social protection on labor force participation and employment status. And the findings reveal uh, that the household social protection income as a share of household expenditure has a small negative effect on the probability of an individual's labor force participation. So this negative effect holds for both prime age and elderly categories of both genders, while there was no significant effect of the probability of labor force participation among youth. But having said that, the effect was very small. It was very negligible. But with regard to the effect of employment status, uh, the findings reveal a positive effect. Again, a very small, uh, uh, very small uh, uh, positive effect on em some employment categories like 
own account worker uh, compared to un unpaid family workers. But again, yeah, as I said, it, the, the marginal effects were very small. So there were some, um, um, so there are some policy implications uh, uh, based on this uh, 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 findings of, of this study. Basically, um, um, it actually stresses the need for improvement of the uh, current social protection system, in particular to po put more emphasis uh, on the labor market related uh, uh, social protection programs such as skills and livelihood development program that in a way help directly to improve the labor force participation and employment status. This is particularly important given the low female labor force participation and high unemployment rate as well as a higher share of informal sector employment in the country. And what we find at the moment, even though we have large number of social protection uh, programs, that there is some sort of an inequitable distribution of resources within the existing social protection system. Actually, the large share of the social protection expenditure, more than 50% of the social protection budget goes to the, um, uh, uh, for the, uh, the pensions for the public sector workers, which actually benefits only 20% of the, um, the, the elderly in the country. And the share, share of social protection expenditure, especially which goes to the labor market oriented programs like skills development and livelihood support programs is only about 10% or less. So there is uh, definitely a need for some improvement and, and uh, together with that there's a need for some reforms in also in the existing pension scheme which is currently the uh, fully funded by the government, it's a non-contributory pension scheme and also to address uh, various targeting errors of the cash transfer programs like Samurdi which currently covers about 30% of the uh, households in the country. So this in a way would help to sort of make better use of the limited available resources for the benefit of the most needy groups. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, can we have Dr. Bilisha uh, Viratne now? Anirvan, can we get them to turn this a little bit diagonally so that people don't have to turn themselves? This table, somebody can do this. No, this whole thing can be turned. The dais. Yeah, yeah, the dais. Yeah, so that, you know, just that way. No, no, not this way. The other way around. The other way around. The other way around. A little more. Yeah, that's it. So that people, everybody doesn't have to. So. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about this exploratory study that I did about the, the possibility of the recruitment channel reducing the vulnerability of female domestic workers in the Middle East. So just to motivate you a little bit, um, internationally there are about three, uh, 232 million migrants and nearly half of them are females. And uh, domestic work is a popular occupation among female migrant workers. And in the Middle East, about one in every three worker is a domestic worker. And the majority of these domestic workers in the Middle East are migrants. And when you come to the context of Sri Lanka, about 37% of migrants from Sri Lanka are females. And um, over 80% of these females are domestic workers. And Almost everybody of these uh, female domestic workers head to the Middle East. Just to so show you some trends. Um, so the total number of departures have been nicely increasing over the years. And the female departures have been somewhat stable because um, and the male component has been rising over the years. And when you look at the female <coughs> domestic workers, the housemaid component also it has been somewhat stable. But despite this growing number of male proportion of uh, migrant workers from Sri Lanka, when you look at the complaints made by uh, Sri Lankan workers, we see that an overwhelming number are made by female workers. And amongst them, it's like a huge number by female domestic workers. So when you go to look at some of the complaints, the top three are like almost very close by as of 2012 data. It's non-payment of agreed wages, sickness, and harassment of both sexual and phys uh, physical of nature. <coughs> um, so to talk a little bit of the literature that deals with vulnerability of female migrant workers, 
It said that females, uh, women, are experiencing triple exploitation, one, because they are females, and one, because they are workers, and the third, because they are foreigners, a destination. And also, uh, female domestic workers are disproportionately vulnerable at destination than another similar woman who would have done another job. Some of the reasons why they're disproportionately vulnerable that come out of rich literature is that the overlap of their living quarters and work environment, because they end up working in a household, there is no clear workspace and a rest space or home space for them. So there's an overlap and there's high tendency for exploitation because of that. Similarly, there is no start time for their work and there is no like a end time or their free time. So because of these two, there's high probability for these um, female domestic workers to be exploited at destination. And also, uh, very interestingly, in most of the Middle Eastern countries, the these employees are not, these domestic workers are not considered as employees. And the people who hire them are often not considered as employers. And the households that where they work are not considered as workplace. Because of that, they don't come under any of the labor laws, which would have otherwise protected them at the destination. So together with this, and also there isn't any other party, I mean most cases, but sometimes you do find, in most cases there isn't any party who's interested in the welfare of these female domestic workers. So, uh, and then also, often people who go into foreign, uh, go to work as domestic workers are already poor people in their country and they are already vulnerable people. So together all these conditions make them very susceptible to all these adverse situations at destination. So in literature, it's often hypothesized that the informal recruitment channel contributes towards being highly, uh, being, uh, towards being more risk, having a greater risk uh, of being, a, um, of experiencing vulnerability at destination. However, this has not been empirically, uh, specifically uh, quantitatively tested in literature. So in that context, in my exploratory work, what I'm trying to do is to see whether there is a to answer this research question, uh, how does different recruitment channels of female uh, domestic workers affect their likelihood of experiencing difficulties at destination? So my aim is to do this sort of a first quantitative study to see whether there's an association between the recruitment channel and vulnerability at destination. So I used this data set from Sri Lanka that was gathered in 2012 by the ILO and an institute called SPARC. It's a small sample of about 2,000 returning migrants, and the majority of the, uh, the sample is of females, and of the female domestic workers, about over a quarter has experienced some sort of difficulty at destination. And the most common was uh, being fo forced to perform activities that they had not agreed to. And uh, some of the summary statistics, we see that there were four main uh, four main types of recruitment. First is on own. On own meaning like if I have my friend or my sister working in the Middle East, she might find me a job over there. So that's an on own way of recruitment. And other is the official, the normal, formal recruitment uh, agents. Other is a combination of the agent and a sub agent. A sub agent is a person who might work at the grassroots level in the villages, who will go from house to house and scout potential migrants and say there's a nice job, why don't you go in that sort of a very informal personal level um, negotiation. So, and the fourth category is purely sub-agents. And um, most of these female domestic workers have made nearly two trips. And in my sample, the average wa age was about uh, 35 years. And most of them stayed for a little over two years at uh, destination. And majority of them were married and had an education of oh, where is this? Okay. Had an education of about sixth to tenth grade and most of them went to the went to Saudi Arabia and as expected the majority of the Sri Lankan population are single Buddhist and the, this is reflected in the female domestic worker departures also. Um, so coming to my methodology, I my quantitative model is a discrete choice model, a probit model. Uh, so I estimate the probability of vulnerability as a function of demographic variables, work variables, and the key variable is the recruitment channel. And also I have a small qualitative component where I validate my results by going to the field and interviewing some key informants. So um, these are the outcome variables that I consider. 
being forced to work a longer hours with or without overtime, um, having to uh, work under conditions where there's potential health risks, um, being exposed to violence or violent threats, being forced to perform other activities that they did not agree to, being forced to perform for uh, uh, forced to work for an other employer, forced to work at a different location, and being forced to stay longer than they uh, agreed to, and other types. And the other control variables are demographic. And I said my key variables are the recruitment channel, and also I control for work-related variables. So this is the model. And I, as most of you know, when you estimate a probit model, only the coefficients will only tell you the direction of the association. If you want to see the magnitude, you'll have to look at the marginal effects. So looking at the marginal effects. So let's first focus on my first model on this column. First, what I do is I lump all sorts of difficulties together and look at the outcome, whether one was vulnerable or not. And then, oopsie daisy. Okay. Surprisingly, I see that those who go through an agent has a higher probability of experiencing vulnerability. Specifically, compared to a person who went on their own, if a woman went through an agent, she will have a seven percentage point higher probability of experiencing any type of vulnerability. Now, this is a little contrary to what I expected. This is the formal and the most kind of legal way of going, and you end up being in trouble. But then, here, I lump all sorts of different vulnerabilities together. So next, I take each vulnerability separately, each or some similar vulnerabilities separately, and model again and see. So then when I look at being exposed to violence, uh, violent threats, or being forced to work in jobs that had health risks, I don't see any effect on any recruitment channel. And next, in the third one, I look at the, probabili uh, the vulnerability outcome is being forced to perform activities that they did not agree. And here I see that those who went through the combination of an agent and a sub-agent has a higher probability of experience in this vulnerability. So now when I went to the field to validate my results and other literature, what I found was the explanation to this was that the involvement of a sub-agent brings in an uh, element of informality into this otherwise very formal recruitment process. So as I said before, this sub-agent is the one who goes in the village at the grou grassroots level and scouts people. So what he would often say is he, he would paint a very rosy picture saying that, oh, there's this nice little family in the Middle East with one kid, two adults. You only have to do a little bit of cleaning and cooking. But only when this poor woman goes to the destination, see, she will see that in addition to these three families, there's a grandmother who she has to take care of. And the house has about five rooms she has to mop daily. And lots of other things that she didn't agree. And this comes about because there was this informal sub-agent who provided some inaccurate information. So that's the explanation that I found, which drives this result of higher probability of experience in this vulnerability. So next, when I look at the vulnerability of having to perform longer hours than agreed, very encouraging. I see that those who go through an agent have a lower for probability of experience in this vulnerability, meaning those who go through an agent are protected. They will not be forced to work for longer hours without over, uh, overtime payment. So that is encouraging. You would want the formal channel to give some protection to your workers. And uh, finally, what I look at is the vulnerability of being forced to uh, work for a different employer. Here again, quite contrary to what I just found out, I see that those who go through an agent has a, uh, will have a higher probability of being forced to work for a different employer. So again, when I went to the field and uh, when I reviewed more and more literature, what I found was that the agent has a large pool of employers at destination. And these agents also have this system of double contracts. Double contracts meaning you will sign one contract at S in Sri Lanka before departure. When you go to the destination, you have to sign a second contract. And the second contract will give you, of course, you're signing second contract because it's different from the first. So now you have a different terms of reference in your job description, and you might have a different employer. And also, in some cases, in these Middle Eastern countries, these are multi-families living in one household. Like the, my, my parents will employ 
employ a domestic worker, but in a different wing of the house, there will be my family, my sister's family, my brother's family. So the woman who goes to work for my dad will end up working for all these little other families. So then there is a, he, she's been forced to work for different employers than she agreed to. So these sorts of little things would drive a result like this. Oh, I'm very bad at this aiming thing. So what we see is that I don't see a clear relationship with the recruitment channel and the difficulty faced at destination. So the results differ by the difficulty faced at destination and the recruitment channel. But when you look at some other characteristics, I see some consistent results. For instance, when you look at the number of trips, in many instances, higher the number of trips, higher the probability. This is also kind of prob puzzling. No? You will think that the one who is more experienced will be better off. But what I think is this is kind of data driven. Those who had problems at destination might have come back because it was a bad employer and then she would go back. So that then these people who had a good employer might stay back. So they might not show that they are coming back. So this might be driving the results. And also, on the other hand, it could be that people who have gone many instances would know what their rights are, would know what, what is exploitation, and they would have reported it more than the other person who is inexperienced. So when we look at age, as expected, mature people know how to handle things, and they don't fall into trouble at destination. And divorced and separated people have a higher tendency to experience two types of vulnerabilities, the grouped one and also this one. So what I think there are two things that possibly could drive this result. One is that these people don't have a partner, divorced or separate. So the employer might know this and might try to kind of exploit this person because there's nobody to take care of her. And also, on the other hand, it could be that this person is divorced or separated, meaning she had problems living in a close proximity in the family at home. Maybe this difficulty in living in close proximity with a partner, with a family, is replicated when she's uprooted and planted in another family environment, in a household, and she finds it again difficult to deal with that home setting. So maybe that is stealing that one. So again, um, the other results, as expected, compared to people who have not any schooling, those who have schooling don't get into trouble, they are protected at destination. And finally, a very surprising one, Muslim Islam women are more vulnerable at destination. This is also not what I expected. And again, when I went and met lots of agents and other officials in Sri Lanka, what they said was, employers in the Middle East prefer Muslim women because they're culturally similar and they will know how to do things in the Middle East. But unfortunately, the culture of Muslim and the religion of Islam practiced in Sri Lanka and the Middle East are slightly different. So when this Muslim woman goes and does something different in the Middle East, the employer had a higher expectation for her and now she's disappointed and then that creates problem. But if a Buddhist, single Buddhist woman went and did something different, there's a wider margin. She doesn't know my culture. I should realize that I can't expect wonders from this woman. So that sort of a thing might be driving this result. That's what I found out. So finally, coming back to my research question, how does the different recruitment channels of female domestic workers affect their likelihood of experiencing difficulties at destination? My short answer, it, answer is the effect varies by the difficulty experience because some were positive, some were negative. And as we realized, vulnerability is multifaceted and involves various types of issues. And different aspects of vulnerability can be minimized through different recruitment channels. And the the most important thing is no recruitment channel will protect migrants from all types of vulnerability. So finally, my recommendation is potential migrants need to be informed about different types of vulnerabilities, different types of recruitment channels, and the various uh, vulnerabilities associated with each recruitment channel. And also, all in all, potential migrant workers should be educated about how to make a calculated decision in the context of these various vulnerabilities and recruitment channels. Thank you. Thank you very much.
uh, Belisa, I, I, I really enjoyed reading your paper. Um, and uh, first, this is a question you ask. I, I, I just put this up front because uh, uh, what, sh what she's looking at is how vulnerable uh, domestic female migrants are in the destination. And she finds that uh, the, and how does the recruitment channel affect vulnerability? And she finds that for different natures of vulnerability, different recruitment channels affect the worker differently. Okay, some, uh, some interesting things about the paper that are remarkable. Um, one, you're very upfront that your data is not representative. Maybe you didn't mention it as much in, during the presentation, but in the paper it's clear that you're clear that your data is not representative. And then uh, you're also very clear that you're, what you're arriving at are not causal relationships, but associations. So that was refreshing. Um, a few comments. Uh, you need to emphasize that what you're studying is the last episode of migration. So the fact that 72% don't report uh, facing any problem, uh, this statistic would, may change drastically if you look at first episode of migration. So you, you need to emphasize this. Okay, uh, to me there seems, while reading the paper, there seems to be uh, a, a bias I I in your mind that uh, maybe if people go through formal channels, through the agents, uh, they, they should uh, be better off. Uh, so I could, on the other hand, hold an alternative hypothesis where I feel that if they go through their own networks, uh, they have more information, uh, and so they may be better off or if they go through an informal channel, the informal guy need to, needs to keep his reputation going, and so he's more careful uh, that the match is good for the migrant. So, you know, there, there are other theories which might argue a very alternative hypothesis. Um, and, and also in your entire exposition, if, if your ex ante hypothesis is that the agent should be doing a better job, then uh, a, a, a more expanded ex, uh, explanation of what is it that the agent is legally bound to do. Is he, is he just bound to make the initial match? Uh, if that's the case, there's really no reason for us to ex ante believe that there'll be less vulnerability if the domestic worker goes through an agent. Uh, if it's not the case, then you need to uh, expand on that in the paper. If, if his legal obligation is beyond making the initial match. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, one, one thing you notice in your uh, other explanatory variables is divorced or separated women face greater problems. So I think it's, it's, it's uh, making a huge leap of judgment when you say that uh, you know, they didn't get along well. Well, they didn't get along well with one other human being and, and the family. It doesn't mean that they, they won't do well in the rest of society. So I think that's... Uh, and then finally, the prescription. Uh, you need to emphasize that it's the Sri Lankan government that needs to do more. Uh, so, I mean, these workers have no status under the law, under the destination country law of being employees. So really, no matter what recruitment channel they go through, uh, they have no protection under the law, and it's the Sri Lankan government, I think, that needs to do more. Um, and interestingly, there was a module in your survey which talked about, uh, which elicited respon responses from the migrant workers themselves as to what they think the government should do. So I've, I'm wondering if you studied that module and. What was it that the workers were themselves saying that they want their government to do? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, VP. <coughs> yeah, can we have Joy? Yeah, sure. Hi. Uh, thanks again for inviting me to be a discussant to this uh, session. Yeah. I will be discussing the first paper by uh, Ganga, which uh, the paper I find very interesting. Uh, but I would like to look at this paper in a larger perspective. Uh, the paper is about uh, the association between social policies and labor market outcomes. 
the larger perspective is that you know sri lanka along with a few other regions like kerala or jamaica uh, there's been much uh, it has attracted much attention from scholars from around the 1980s or so uh, for its peculiar combination of very good outcomes in social development but very low incomes and um, i think amartya sen has probably done the most in kind of unraveling this uh, paradox and he argued that uh, this is because of uh, public action what he calls public action uh, which is mainly led by public policies but not only government policies the actions of media uh, the actions of uh, uh, opposition parties and so on so that is one uh, point uh, but i think this paradox has can also be looked at in the reverse direction why is it that these regions uh, sri lanka kerala uh, they have such good indicators of social development but why is it that their economic growth uh, was not very fast at least for, in, for instance in kerala's case kerala was uh, very good in these indicators but its economic growth until the 1990s was much slower than the indian average and the argument has always been that uh, look these regions uh, the social policies may act as a disincentive uh, may kind of hinder uh, like the fact that government is providing uh, unemployment benefits and so on probably hinder the workers the possible uh, potential workers from entering the labor market so i think that is probably the motivation uh, in this paper so uh, and also you know social policies can might push up wages and therefore uh, discourage workers from entering the labor market so this uh, ganga's paper looks at i think two types of uh, empirical investigation uh, tries to address two things what be, what has been the impact of social policies one on labor market participation and two on the type of employment and i think the results find a possible link uh social higher spending on social exp, higher social ex, social expenditures may lead to lower labor force participation and uh, especially in sri lanka's case she mentions uh, female labor participation has been particularly low so i would like to raise two points here i mean i would like to make two points here first is that uh, because i think you know when you talk about female labor participation as is very clear from the paper it's mainly female labor participation not male labor participation is high in uh, relatively high uh, but you know the problem here is i mean i would like to kind of uh, give a uh, make a point here that you know this association between female labor participation on the one hand and other indicators such as income or social expenditure uh, may be a little complicated and maybe it's not linear uh, if you for instance if you plot female labor participation against per capita income what you get is kind of across countries you get a u curve uh, female labor participation is relatively high among uh, countries among poor countries uh, and then it kind of uh, labor participation comes down uh, i think generally what happens is uh, female labor participation is high in when agriculture as long as agriculture is the main occupation then once workers move out of agriculture uh, it depends like in east asia workers moved out of agriculture and into manufacturing what in east asia what you see is a very large increase in female labor participation but in uh, south asia including india and uh, not in bangladesh including india and sri lanka uh, manufacturing has not been employing much people uh, and therefore uh, you find uh, female labor participation particularly low if you look at the recent evidence from india uh, from nsso uh, we find that female labor participation uh, in india has increased rural female labor participation in india has, india has increased in 2004 5 relative to 1999 2000 uh, but especially this increase was in agricultural employment female employment in agriculture but it was it was particularly puzzling because the period from 99 to 99 to 2005 was a period of slow agricultural growth so some scholars i mean de more detailed studies have found that 
this increase in female part labor participation in 2004-05 could be attributed to distress employment. Females joined the labor force because of the absence of other employment opportunities. 2009-10, the 2004-05 to 2009-10 period was a period of fast agricultural growth, relatively faster agricultural growth, and it was also a period when uh, there were uh, more social policies, uh, mainly the employment guarantee scheme, MG and REGA. <laughs> And what you see in 2009-10 is a decline in female labor participation in India. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is, if you are looking at what causes or what explains female labor, labor participation, at least going by the Indian experience, I think there are two things. One is a movement away from agriculture, which could be, uh, you know, which could be like in this Indian case, a movement away from distress employment. But the other reason why female labor participation is not increasing could be because uh, employment opportunities are not generated in manufacturing and other non-agricultural sectors at a fast enough pace. So uh, again, my point here is that, is it, I mean, you're looking at the association between social policies and labor participation. So my question is, is the problem, is the problem is with social policies or is it that there is something else uh, which is hindering employment generation in manufacturing and other non-agricultural sectors. So that could be. Uh, and you know, I, I really, th I really fr feel that uh, social policies uh, and the associated increase in human development, uh, as in both in wages and other indicators of human development. Uh, if I if I again use the Amartya Sen term, can have, I mean they are, they have an intrinsic worth. They are important in themselves because they, in, especially in poor countries, uh, poor in the poor South Asian region, they can really help uh, improve the livelihoods. And the data also shows in the Indian case, 2009-10 data related to 2004-05, there's been a sharp reduction. There's been a clear reduction in poverty in India because this was also a period of uh, improved social spending. So it has an intrinsic worth, but secondly, it also has an instrumental importance. It can help economic growth, social policies, and uh, the resultant increase in improvement in health, in education, can actually be uh, an instrument for future economic progress. But that's a little tricky thing. In East Asia, this has happened. In East Asia, uh, improved education, health was the springboard for future economic growth. But uh, in many countries, like in Kerala, for instance, uh, or in India in general, or in South Asia in general, you don't find that. You don't find this movement uh, to uh, manufacturing uh, and other services uh, and other uh, economic activities. But that, I think, also has, uh, I believe, uh, just one more minute. Uh, like if, I, if you look at the East Asian experience here, uh, in East Asia, the movement was, I mean, once workers became educated, they actually moved into higher value-adding activities. Uh, they, for instance, in Singapore, uh, I, I remember reading uh, <coughs> one particular statement from a Singapore uh, minister in 1973, which was immediately after the government was formed in 19, the new government was formed in 1965, uh, which is that the, the minister was saying that they do not need, uh, like, S Singapore should escape from the gravity pull of low wages uh, and should focus on, not on industries which require cheap labor, but on industries which require, uh, which require higher. <coughs> I, do, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that it's a conscious policy decision of the government to move into higher value-adding industries, uh, such as electronics, and not to focus just on uh, cheap industries. So, like, I mean, I will just mm. conclude. Uh, so, so, I probably, I mean, this association between social policies and labor participation, uh, <coughs> I believe, I therefore, um, I mean, I, I just want to, uh, uh, you know, emphasize these two points. It, it, it has an intrinsic importance. It can lead to poverty reduction. It can lead to improvement in human development. And 
On the second question on whether it can also lead to improvement in economic growth, uh, I think it's not just social policies. It also requires more, greater intervention <coughs> from the government in economic and industrial development. If that doesn't happen, like it doesn't happen in South Asia, it doesn't happen in India, it doesn't happen uh, in Sri Lanka, this may not occur. But it has happened in East Asia and it has, uh, you know, social policies had a different impact. I'm sorry I kind of strayed a little bit, but thank you. Thanks, Dr. Thomas. Mm. So <coughs> let me open this up to discussion and some questions. And we'll take the last five minutes for uh, a response. Yes. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Ganga. Where is model three? If model one, model two. You didn't talk about employment. I thought that should be model three. How does social policy affect employment level or employment rate, whatever it is? Uh, or an unemployment, either way. So I thought that was a, was a strategic choice or data, what? Secondly, you say that um, social policy, results show, and we discussed and pointed that out, the social spending, social policy spendings, uh, or programs have a minor negative effect on participation. And then you lament at the end that the most of the spending is goes to social insurance rather than the protection of the labor market, LMP protections. But your results are negative, so why do you want more? It'll be more uh, negative impact on, on participation, would be defeating the purpose. Uh, you didn't analyze it, you did say that innovations, the spending quality should be improved. The kind of uh, program they you know, spend on should be uh, rethought and maybe have a better impact. And if you look around the internationally, female labor force uh, participation depend on critical uh, issues like the, uh, the conditions of the job, the maternity leaves, the weeks off during maternity, re-entry into labor force with seniority, and um, childcare benefits with the tax laws allow the uh, worker to write off the tax of the childcare expense number. It's a huge slew of things where countries like, you know, neighbors differ a lot between Spain and Portugal, US and Canada, and also within Scandinavia, you have variations. So perhaps you can have this industry data, even perhaps within Sco uh, Sri Lanka, where in some industries they have better laws, and um, because some of international companies would be bound by international laws. So if you're working for Oracle, they will uh, probably more or less give you the Oracle pack package for female employees, where women who are in pregnancy, you can stay from work from home and things like that. All right. Thanks. Uh, I have questions for both the papers. So, uh, for the first one, uh, so uh, um, perhaps I didn't understand uh, it very well, but uh, you also have disability allowance and uh, pensions as a part of your social protection, uh, uh, total uh, social protection provided. So, in case of disabled people or uh, people who are old and who are pensioners, they're anyways having a very low probability of, w like their probability of working would perhaps be lower than that of the rest of the population. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm not very sure if uh, your empirical specification uh, addresses this issue of, oh, yeah, yeah, right, later. So whatever little I know about the domestic workers, especially from uh, who go to Singapore for working, they have very strong uh, like laws in Singapore and employment exchanges there. And uh, people from Sri Lanka, Philippines, uh, Indonesia migrate to Singapore for doing domestic work. So if you have um, any knowledge to share, uh, like you know how how the processes differ in a country like Singapore with a wee like Middle East, where uh, they might be more uh, prone exploitation or it could be a subject of future research something in like in Singapore legislation is uh, they, have, they have very different legislation to protect these workers yes and uh, and the, and perhaps the government itself is uh, it, it provides an employment exchange uh, uh, between uh, the domestic workers who come in and uh, people in Singapore who want to hire them and they have contracts and yearly contracts or something like that, but perhaps a review of that system and how other countries can replicate it uh, could be a thing. Okay. My question is for Belisha. 
uh, I just uh, want I, I have three questions. First uh, is, do you think uh, a labor union would help in such a case? Second, <laughs> uh, like, yeah. is it the case like initial vu vulnerability of a often put of a potential employee affects uh, his or her, or her uh, post-employment vulnerability? Like in the case where agent knows uh, the situation of the worker and is exp uh, like. He knows that the worker has less bargaining power. And third is like, is the next generation as vulnerable and as unaware as the first one? Like, is there any transfer of information? Yeah. My question is. Uh, my question is uh, to uh, Ganga. Uh, my question is, uh, is it uh, that uh, option is given uh, not to opt, you know, for the social protection? Uh, that could be one reason. And another thing is, is it that they do not have any access? You know, or it's from, you know, there is no compulsion from the government or anything as such. Because why I'm asking is that, you know, if you can opt out, I'm from Exim Bank of India. so. Recently, I visited with my colleagues, Sri Lanka. Uh, being an export financer, the question that we ask is that do they opt for insurance, credit insurance, you know? They prefer not to, many of them. So is the same tendency occurs in, in terms of employment, you know? Uh, may not be women specific, may not be female specific. It might be in the system. I don't know, you know, such question you may like to ask, you know, and do certain survey on that. And number two, uh, in terms of female participation, as uh, uh, Mr. Jain Thomas had mentioned, uh, it's mostly tea sector. You know, tea sector is quite a dominant sector in Sri Lanka. I think female participation by default should be more. And again, manufacturing sector is not developed so much. You know, if you look at the export, it grows at, you know, it doesn't have a quick jump or, you know, in the recent past, if you look at that. The same is true in the case of manufacturing sector. You may like to analyze from that angle again. Thanks. Yeah, yes, so, thanks. Yeah. I think y you have a question? Yeah, yeah sure. My question is to the vulnerable worker, domestic workers paper. Yeah, uh, something similar to what the discussant also said. Would, do you anyhow have the data on the uh, workers who actually get the job on their own, like from their relatives and friends? Because if you have that data, then the comparison, like you were also talking about it, if of course you have a personal bonding with the person, you're probably able to guide the person better, either to come to that particular uh, I mean, place e uh, like Middle East to work or not. And s the agents and the sub agents probably do not have that much of a personal association with the worker. That's why they might be, you know, even if it's a formal channel, since they do not really care personally about the person, therefore they might not really care about, you know, if the person is facing any problems as such. So there may be an informal and a relative or a friend giving you information might turn out to be something which is better for the worker who has to go there. I think, yes, so we are sort of running. <laughs> I think we can uh, just, no, I'll just briefly think and then you can answer. Uh, if you want to come here, you can answer. So I think both these papers have, I will just want to say a few things. On the first paper, uh, you know, labor market participation and the kind of variables which intervene, it's always very complicated, you know. And in this case, it's not very clear to me that, that the small effects that you see are necessarily only due to social protection. Uh, first of all, we're taking two very distinct segments. We're taking a formal sector segment where pensions is an issue and uh, where pension social insurance is in the form of pensions and so on. And then we are taking an informal sector segment where the situation, we don't know what the situation would have been without social assistance. So, I mean, you know, overall, we are seeing a small decline in uh, labor participation but whether it is due to the impact of social assistance in one segment and social insurance in another segment is something which I think one needs to be careful about, 
commenting. Of course, there could be situations where social uh, uh, protection could actually influence uh, labor force protection, uh, labor force participation, but that also can be a good thing as well as a bad thing. You know, uh, uh, just because labor force participation comes down in the context of the poor and let's say poor women doesn't necessarily always be a bad thing. You know, because uh, there, there, there are a whole range of uh, work situations which, which, which the poor and women find themselves, which in, if are distress driven, uh, which have a very negative impact on their lives and their working lives. And if some of that actually comes down as a result of social protection, honestly, it's not a bad thing. You know, so social if labor force participation itself may not be the best way of measuring welfare impacts or even economy-wide impacts, for that matter, uh, as far as the poor and the vulnerable segments of society are concerned. So, what I mean, I think one needs to be cautious about drawing overall uh, conclusions, in my view. And the effects can vary; where they can vary across situations. Some of them can actually be negative, depending on the way social protection programs are designed. But it's not always a bad thing if you know the poor work less or if women who don't work in highly vulnerable situations or don't have to work in highly vulnerable situations. Um, on, the, uh, on the Sri Lankan case, it's very interesting because basically what the paper is saying is that if you want to now look at uh, what impacts on vulnerability, then one has to look at two things which are other than the one usually focuses on. I mean, not that they're not focused upon, that uh, recruitment channels has always been something you know, which has been focused upon, but now one needs to look at the labor market situation in the destination country, as far as domestics are concerned, yeah, and that is really the, the major variable, but then also one needs to look at the kind of people involved, the way they share information, the kind of information that is available to them, their social networks and so on. So the, over a period of time, it seems that recruitment channels matter less now, but it is the other variables which are now much more overriding. And that, you know, the one, is one of the questioners said that, well, Singapore, the market is so well regulated, much better regulated, and you can see that it works very differently from the kind of situation. And uh, within the Middle East, you obviously, uh, you didn't point out, but when you looked at country-specific differences, I don't know what your control was. Was it Saudi Arabia? No, the country, con you had Kuwait, you had uh, Dubai, so then, so the control was what, Saudi Arabia? Because that, that, that's the largest, I mean. No, Dubai was mentioned here. It was probably Saudi Arabia. So you can see that, sorry? I don't know, but you can see that compared to Saudi Arabia, the, the marginal effects are so much smaller than in Dubai and, uh, you know, as one would expect in Dubai and Kuwait. And then you would see something else in the Qatar. So there are, you know, very country-specific ways in which also labor markets function in, in the countries within the Middle East. That seems to make a lot of difference also. <coughs> now, let me stop here, but uh, maybe we can have uh, responses, brief responses from both of you, both the speakers. Uh, beginning with Dr. Tirekratni, yeah. Would um, you like, yeah. Okay. You can, um, you thank can you for all the comments, and I think there are a lot of questions too. Uh, I'm not sure whether I'm going to answer all of them though, but. Um, um, let me actually clarify a few things now with regard to the um, uh, question raised uh, that I have used disability benefits and pensions, uh, but then, uh, well, by nature, well, maybe uh, their labor force participation or employment probably is lower. Actually, what I used here was, I mean, the only three variables for which the data was available was pensions and samurdi and uh, disability. And how I looked at it was, I mean, some households may be having more than, uh, receive actually more than one of those uh, benefits. Uh, so basically what I looked at was not for individual, uh, those benefits and uh, the, the level of the, the probability of labor force participation for the recipient of that particular benefit because for Samurdi, like it's actually, uh, Samurdi is given for families, not for a particular person. So basically it was, uh, what I looked at was the, the share of social protection income to the family as a percentage of uh, uh, the, uh, the household expenditure and uh, the, the, the effect that it has on the uh, uh, labor force participation of the individuals within that family. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the person who is receiving it. 
Um, and uh, well, I well, um, well uh, there were a lot of actually um, well concerns about this uh, negative effect. But as I mentioned, it's very marginal or it's very negligible. So uh, I have actually mentioned in my paper that I may not be able to uh, uh, draw strong conclusions based on that, but maybe I missed out, out to say it in my uh, presentation. And um, also responding, well, um, thank you for those suggestions actually um, to look at the model three and four. Uh, maybe I should try that out too. Um, and uh, your question was actually, um, well, um, already there's uh, uh, the, the social protection expenditure or income leads to some disincentive effects of why households need more. That's not what I actually suggest. What I suggest is that, um, well, at the moment we have all these programs, but actually there is some sort of an inequitable distribution when you look at the expenditure of or the, or the social protection budget. This is actually excluding uh, uh, general education and health budgets, but when you take into account all these, some you know, hundred or different, different small, small programs, uh, the larger portion, about 55 percent of the total budget, goes to the public sector pension scheme, which is a non-contributory pension scheme. So there is a need for these reforms of this non-contributory pension scheme, which actually uh, bene currently benefits only 20 percent of the elderly in the country. And then the Samurdi program, um, uh, which is the largest uh, uh, social assistance program, which covers about 30% of the households, but the poverty level is only so uh, 6.7. So what I actually suggest was with these reforms, so with the sort of uh, the, the resources that we can actually draw from these programs could be used perhaps for more labor market oriented programs, which could directly help to support labor force participation among females or some skills development, employment support programs, which in a way help to these continuing uh, uh, problems of labor force participation. Um, one question there was, uh, I don't know if there's a question or comment, though, uh, in the plantation sector that uh, female, yes, actually I find it here uh, in my model too, that being uh, uh, belonging to a uh, household uh, within the estate sector, uh, it actually increases the probability of labor force participation among females. So that is actually shown. Um, there were lots of actually comments from the discussant. I'm not going to respond to all of all of it, but uh, they will be very useful. But one is uh, that you mentioned, uh, well, it's not just the social protection policies, but there may be obviously other uh, factors um, uh, affecting this situation and then other measures that needs to be uh, considered and other factors that affecting female uh, labor force, but obviously, it's I. I mean, I uh, I didn't actually mean to say that social protection is the one uh, which uh, uh, reduces the lab female labor force participation. But there are so many. It's it's a bit of a paradox in Sri Lanka because Sri Lanka having very high level of education and you know uh, gender uh, sort of uh, um, the, the um, gender parity in education level. Uh, but still, we have very low uh, female uh, l uh, um, labor force participation. But this is due to uh, various labor market related other um, issues, gender wage gaps, and uh, a lack of opportunities and distance to work, and so on and so forth. I think recently I ILO did a, a study uh, you know, on looking at the uh, low female, or the reasons for low female labor force participation in Sri Lanka. Anyway, thank you very much. Um. Uh, thank you for the very wonderful comments by the reader. Um, I think there were five main points that you raised, and out of those, two were com uh, questions that I could respond to. Um, one was that, what is the legal uh, requirement that the agent has to perform, sort of thing. So, um, as far as I know, the agent, it's not only a matching that he has to do, he has to take care of the person, and if there is some complaint, it's the agent's responsibility to get the person down back to the country if there's an issue. So there is an ongoing commitment with the agent. So agent is responsible for the well-being of the worker at destination. So in that sense, there is sort of a protection mechanism through, the, uh, through recruitment through an, a formal agent. And um, I correct very, very much agree with you that the government should do more to protect them. And also about the other comment that uh, the results might change if I look at the first migration incident. And, uh, and the other question that you raised was, uh, what did the workers say in their little component about that? 
mo mostly this survey was about reintegration sort of aspect. So in the after they come back, most often people tend to forget the bad experiences there, and they want to focus on what can we do here. So they want in that component about the suggestions, they're mostly focused on what the government can do in terms of reintegration, what sort of loans they can give, what sort of you know, training they can give for them to build themselves up in back in Sri Lanka. So that sort of information only that broadly, but perhaps if I go through each and every response, I might find something interesting. So um, those were the things. And yes, I, I really like your idea about the alternative hypothesis about perhaps uh, going through on account own uh, contacts might have better information. And on that same note, I think you raised the point, but you, yours was a different thing. You asked the model already has on account workers. So the information is there. That is the baseline category. So it's, it's already there in the model. Um, and coming to your question about Singapore, it's very interesting. But the problem with migration research in Sri Lanka is data. It's data is very poor. If you might have noticed, I was quoting 2012 data, and now it's 2015. Remittances is such a big component in Sri Lanka, but still we don't have good data on migration. You know about how much? 9% of GDP is uh, remittances, but still we have 2012 data. Despite remittance and migration being so important in Sri Lanka, we are very poor in terms of migration data. And s as I said in the paper, this data source was also not representative. So about migration to Singapore, we don't have much data. Perhaps I can do, and I'm trying very hard to raise some funds to do a proper survey. Still, it has not succeeded. So hopefully, eventually, I'll get there one day. And uh, there was an interesting question whether a union would help. Certainly, it would. But the problem, as I said, in, in the Middle East, they are not considered employees. I think being an employee is a pre precondition to have a union, right? If you're at home, you can have a labor union. <laughs> so as long as you're recognized as an employee at destination, perhaps the next later, later stage step would be to have a union. But first, recognize them as workers. Then they can eventually form a union. Um, and as our chair said, more and more maybe recruitment channels are getting less important and other variables are becoming important. And though I didn't mention, none of the destination controls that I put up became significant in the model. So at least in the Middle East, it doesn't matter where you go. Perhaps when you look at a larger picture, perhaps it might matter. And also maybe we should, with good data, we can throw in some more control variables for other things. And then we will get, as you said, how other, other aspects matter. So. Thank you very much for all the wonderful comments and suggestions. Thank you. So that uh, finishes the technical sessions for today. As you know, we have a distinguished lecture by uh, Professor Arvind Panagaria starting at 6.30. And that we really have to start at 6.30. It's already been a long day. So please uh, assemble here in time. We start the class before 6.30. And in the meantime, uh, there's tea, coffee. There's some fresh air outside as well. But do, do come back in time. Thank you. <laughs>